insights, reports, updates. This is the progress. Progress. The progress report. Hello there, Lennox Gasper here, and welcome to Progress Report. Today we have in our studio Honorable Minister Gail Teixeira, who is the Minister of Parliamentary Affairs and Governance. Minister, thank you for taking the time out to be on this program and welcome well, to Progress Report. Thank you very report. much for having me. Thank you. Very well. Minister, the PPPC government in its manifesto has promised to embrace the inclusive governance model. From the government's perspective, and as a minister of governance, what is the government's idea of inclusive governance? Well, first of all, Lennox, I, I think that it's important for us to have a discussion as Guyanese of what we mean by inclusionary democracy, which is what is covered in our constitution. Article 13 makes it very clear that our people must be part of decision making in an incremental, increasing way. So the constitution recognizes that democracy is something that is built and it develops as we go on in time. And so that it talks about increasing involvement and participation of the people in decision making of the country, particularly on issues that affect their lives. So that's the inclusionary model we're talking about as provided for in our constitution. The constitution doesn't go into all the details, but it provides for electoral system that allows for people to be elected to be the people's representatives at local government, regional democratic councils, and of course, gov executive and parliament, as well as even at the Indian village councils to have elections, and, and so too in civil society. The whole issue of democracy must infiltrate every aspect of life, and every organization in Guyana, government and non-government. So first of all, the issue that the president, the president keeps talking about, inclusionary democracy, inclusivity, um, participation, transparency, accountability, these are all the platform that in which we build our government. And so one of the characteristics of the PVP, and if we look from 92 to 2015, was a whole range, uh, a consultative process that was emerging. So when we did the domestic violence bill, the, the medical termination of, of pregnancy bill, highly controversial, it went through layers of consultations. When we did the constitutional reform process, 1999 to 2001, again, the commission heard hundreds and hundreds of recommendations, went out across the country, did the same. And you know, people forget there was an earlier version of that in 96 before Chetty died, and that was another constitutional reform commission headed by Bernard DeSantis that went around the country and then there were elections and of course that was halted. So this whole process of consultation, almost every bill that has been brought to parliament by the PVPC has been one that's gone through layers of consultation. Some are very sectorally specific and others may be more broad in terms of social issues. And then in 2008, um, under President Jack Dill, we created what was called the National Stakeholders Forum, which had 100 NGOs involved in it. And we used to meet two or three times a year. It was informally formal in that sense. And so the president would share it. And we dealt with some of the issues that were politically problematical in the parliament, the appointment of the constitutional bodies, the house-to-house um, -house registration. There were a number of issues like that, including other issues like domestic and sexual violence, for example. And so, then we have the period of 2015 to 2020, where consultative process seems to disappear, evaporate in Guyana. And then we have, we're back in power again. And I challenge anybody, Lennox, in the last, what is it now, a year and a half? Yes. To say where this government and our ministers, our president, our vice president, prime minister, have not been accessible, visible, and in communication. And, I'm, and if I and I can't, I, I wouldn't even bother to compare with the five years, because there's no comparison. How do you compare zero to you know fifty or seventy percent? There's no comparison. And so, when we talk about inclusionary model and inclusiveness and participatory models, the model that has been emerging under the PVPC and has we've gone back to try to what do you call refine it, develop it more, <coughs> because it's a process that. <coughs> First of all, 
The elected officials of the government are accessible. They're visible, and they're out there where the people are. And every single region of Guyana can say that ministers have visited, they've been meetings, they've been consultations. On whether it is an issue, you know, Lennox, of drains in my street, whether it's issues of, you know, farmers' prices, whether it's issues of Armenian land or women's issues, that's for the last year and a half, there's been an explosion of people in our country going to these bottom house meetings, these community meetings, these town hall meetings, and being free and open, whether they voted for APNU or the PUP or ANOG or whoever, to represent themselves. That is inclusivity. That's a model of inclusivity. Now, someone will say, but they're not civil society. How do you know that? When you go to a community, you have farmers' organizations. Farmers come, they belong to organizations. You have women, they belong to women's organizations. You have faith-based organizations, people who believe in God from different religious points of view. But they come from the bedrock of some organization they're associated with. So the power of the, the consultative model and the inclusionary model is that, how do you test it? Are people involved in a variety of areas? And can we say on any which day, we, that we randomly choose that people are involved, that people is somebody talking to somebody about what issues they need to bring? So that's the first thing. And so when there the are discussions in the press about civil society, I challenge that because the people, the ordinary people who are out there in the communities, the rural areas, the townships, and so on, have a voice that they didn't have for a long time. They have a voice. So let's give an example. I understand when Vice President and his team was in Linden. They work from morning till midnight on Sunday. I understand 800 people going forward. Isn't that consultation? Isn't that inclusion? Or is it because they didn't have a label over their head that I'm representing X organization? Come off of it. The power of people is in the fact that they have won the right to speak, they have the right to present themselves, they have the right to criticize, they have the right to give their opinions. And so those rights are being enshrined, they are being promoted, there, there's nobody being shut up about it. You have the freedom of the press. So that's one layer. This large, if you look like a pyramid, the large layers of people who are involved on a daily basis. When you go out and do the gold program, when you go out and do Vin Minister Vindy's win program, and you consult with the women, you give them applications, explain to them how the programs work in their benefit, and they answer them, isn't that part of consultation? When this week, I think it was, um, VP, uh, Vice President, had a meeting at the convention center on drainage and irrigation, which is a major issue. We're a flood-prone country, it's, you know, and we thought it was just the coast. Now it's all in the interior. So climate change and so on. So when you have the vice president convening a meeting with a large group of people about an issue that's of national importance, but also a particular interest of pharmacy, and of course interest for ministers of finance, because it's economy, is economy and how much revenue we lose if there's a flood. And it should be of interest to all of us people because we lose when there's a flood. Our personal possessions as well as uh, we, you have shortages. So you have the president going out to different areas and meeting with people. Every single week there are people being held. So that level of people involvement is phenomenal. And I challenge anybody in this country to find some other part of this region where this is taking place, anything like it. The other thing though, Lennox, is okay, let's move up the ladder a bit more. You have NDCs and RDCs who should be doing consultations and outreaches. Sometimes they're not as great as, as they should be. Then you come to government policies at the higher level, executive. We have bills that we bring. So the whole topic on the local content bill, for example, which was had consultation at the convention center there were more than one consultations on it, and then the Natural Resource Fund. The whole issue of not enough time. This was a bill that was assented to by Mr. Granger in January 19, 2019, when the government had already fallen. It came back and was morphed with changes we made. Large parts of it remained the same, and the large parts we changed. 
In Parliament, a bill cannot be debated unless there's a waiver of the standing orders before six days between the first and the second reading. People had two weeks, over 13 days, to look at it. In the case of Mr. Patterson bringing 14 amendments to the local content bill, we accepted 10 of those 14. And we only saw it the day before. No, we only saw those things were day before. So we had to respond on, on a rapid uh, road, a rapid position. On the natural resource bill, you have two weeks to comment on. You have two weeks to lobby. You have two weeks to do things. But their attitude was, let's take a petition to Palm to block it. No. One has to recognize in democracy some basic fundamentals. A government is elected by the people. They're given a mandate by the electorate whether they voted for them or not, once they have the majority, that they have the responsibility to govern and to make reasonable and responsible decisions on behalf of the people. Democracy is a wonderful thing because it allows for this process of debate and discussion, but somebody at some point has to make a decision. And so in that resource fund, you have this oil reserve, oil revenue, which our country needs. Were we to implement the one that was passed in 2019, the Minister of Finance could have done everything. The changes we made were for the better, in the sense, the involvement of private sector and other individuals who are in it. What does the natural resource law say? It says you can't be an MP or to be a representative on the natural resource fund or the uh, Public Accountability and Oversight Committee. So you knock out all of us who are politicians. It talks about a nominee from the National Assembly for the Natural Resource Fund. And so a majority decision is made. We can't, the, no government in this world can run based on a minority, a minority telling them what to do. You have the mandate from the people, that's why you go to elections, that's why you try to win people to your support. So you have a clear mandate to make decisions. And so, okay, so they don't like it because the persons that came forward for the Natural Resource Fund was not someone they wanted. I'm sorry, you know, I'm sorry that that's happened, but um, that's life. You, you, when you were in government, when the APNU AFC was in government, we remember very clearly, we haven't forgotten, and this is not what we call Lennox, uh, what you call last lick and get back at you type of thing. But people are appointed. I remember what happened in the Police Service Commission, what happened to the promotion of police officers. Uh, so at some point, the Natural Resource Fund, we made a decision by majority in the committee. We made a decision on the uh, person for the Public Accountability and Oversight Committee. Whenever the leading opposition is named, he or she will discourse with the president and give to the president the name of his nominee, who cannot be an MP, by the way. So they have one person on. There are two people from civil society on, because Mr. Barrow, as far as I know, and Mr. Seeley do not represent any political party. So you can't have your cake and eat it. You want civil society, and yet you don't want civil society representatives on these bodies. So. When we look at our, our whole thing, and I, I remind you, Lenos, when we were in a minority as a government, 2012 to 2015, standing orders are clear. Government has a majority in the committees, opposition, so it's 5-4 in, in the committees. Mr. Ramjitan and his AFC and Mr. Rupnurain, Dr. Rupert Rupnurain, brought amendments to the standing orders to reverse it. So the opposition, which had a majority, you now had five seats, and the government had four. And I remember clearly what happened in those committees. The majority five was used over and over again to make sure they got their way. So I'm not getting into this, you know, woe is me, we're not being consulted. I believe that also civil society in our country has to develop and become stronger, develop greater capabilities, to become a stronger and, and responsible voice. Like the media has the freedom, they have the freedom. The media is made uh, by law and by uh, what you call ethics and codes 
of how they are expected to behave. Media can say what they want. You double check your information, you report responsibly, etc. So to a civil society. Their code cannot be different from what are the codes of the media, of the doctors, the nurses, uh, and politicians. We have our code too. So that civil society, and I, what I'm pleased about is that you're seeing new organizations coming up in the last few years. And interestingly, with young people. And that, I believe, is the future of this country. And so I refer to the Natural Stakeholders Forum of 2008 to 2015. What I'm doing now in this new ministry, last year we had a number of consultations, mainly with faith-based organizations, to do with COVID and uh, anti-vaxxing and to try to get them to be more a partner in the whole uh, campaign to try to reduce uh, COVID transmission. This year I've had two stakeholders meetings, one in January and one in March, and we have uh, agreed we'll meet every two months. So the first meeting was we had over 60 people participating by Zoom, representing a broad cross-section of NGOs. And then we had a second one in March where we presented, we asked the to them to, to be apprised of the draft low carbon development strategy. which Because some of the NGOs I deal with may or may not be the ones that get invited to convention center mm -hmm. and stuff like that, but they are civil society bodies. And so the whole uh, consultation on the draft low carbon development strategy is gonna to go to every single region of Guyana as the original low carbon development strategy took two years and went throughout Guyana in every village and everything else. So that is being repeated. That is being repeated. So I think that if one looks at the whole issue from a very narrow perspective, then you're going to come up with these things that, oh, this NGO or this NGO. By the way, some of the NGOs who are complaining were invited to my stakeholders meetings. Now, one or two of them came under different names, under different NGO names, mm -hmm. but they, their NG, the NGOs who were complaining were invited. And so, but they didn't speak. Let's let's talk um, about the complaint. Yes. And bring, um, come more. There are some opinions that mm -hmm. are ventilated in the media that these civil societies and other groups are not basically involved in the decision making. And um, you would have interestingly explained that the various groups as as the government mm. go out and meet with various groups farmers farmer society and all of that and you very beautifully put it that maybe just because they don't have a certain name or label yeah. or class that, or class that's why they've probably taken the position to say that civil society is not being mm. um involved or represented right. could your thoughts in clearing that up i, I think that the, uh, i went back to use the word narrow let me give an example. In the meetings with the Amrini committees, just as ministers going out, we came across the problem of birth certificate registration. So children are born, some are registered, but they don't have the birth certificate. Some people never get registered. And this has been coming up for years. And it came up again when we got into government. How do we talk about making decisions? They raise the issue. People may not know exactly what the law needs to be changed in. We do that. That's our responsibility as government to go to the Eternal General and the Cabinet and say, find how we can fix this problem. And so we amended the birth registration to allow for people an easier way for people. You had a problem where women's organizations and women were talking about the problem of wills. Of uh, The old law, the, pre the, the previous law before we amended it, made it difficult for women whose husband died to inherit. This has been repeatedly raised. Women's organizations have raised it. We amended it. So when you say that they participate in the decision making, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. Because it's a consultative, inclusive process that leads to policy change, that leads to policy change. In what way can a civil society decide for government? All they can do is to say they can take the, the frontal way and draft a law and amend a law and say, look, here, minister, We've done some work for you. Look at this. And I know any minister would, would look at it. You know, um, and you have to recognize, too, that every minister 
meets with NGOs that are relevant to their agency. So if it is, you know, um, Minister Barat with the Miners Associations and the Women Miners Associations, you have um, uh, Minister of Agriculture, all the farmers' organizations, unions were relating to, to guys agriculture, and I could name every minister like that. That's part of the consultative process too. That's part of the inclusion. And as I said, the, the issue of democracy must infiltrate the entire society. That the code you ask a government to apply, that you must be pure too. And to be able to say, we have elections every year, we have a constitution, you know, I mean, I'm being facetious, but yes, it's true. You can't have, how do you have unions in this country, or I uh, shouldn't get myself in trouble, and other organizations that I haven't had elections or the same people get elected all the time. I'm a politician and I've been around for a while. It's not easy to get elected 20, 30 years in a row. It's not. They're young people coming up. You've got to give them space, you know? And so, I mean, but as I said, I truly believe, Lennox, in that the power of the civil society, and I have advocated in the government uh, with the, some of the uh, UN and donor agencies that we look at how can we strengthen them in terms of the administration. There's been a lot of money given to NGOs for programs, and all sorts of things. But I think we have to go back to systems, procedures, institutionalizing structures in the government and outside the government. So you want to be an NGO representing uh, persons in trafficking, persons who are victims. Yes, we need people to come on board and help. How are you not just to have the donor money and you go around doing things, but the issue is afterwards what happens? Where's the sustainability? Where's the continuity? Now that's a challenge for government, it's a challenge for civil society too. So I think that this, the whole issue is being looked at in a very um, staid manner and not a dynamic manner and trying to create a situation of we against them and them against us, which I think is, it, it's, it's, a, it, it's just trying to create a situation instead of looking at what is a progression and how can we better improve it. Minister, what is the government's stand on a project report re um, release such as the study and of a document relating to the Amaila Falls hydropower project? This was um, related in the newspaper. Also. Yeah, I remember when we were in opposition that um, uh, we had uh, raised, remember, they voted twice against the Amaila Falls project in 2014. And so, um, and I remember we had written a Norwegian government when we were in opposition calling on them to have an independent body assess Amila Falls. Um, and the government uh, that, uh, had agreed to that as well. And so the study was done by an independent uh, consultancy chosen by the Norwegian government. None of us had anything. So what I do recall is that the, the newspapers, including Kajo, I think if I'm right, covered a whole range of aspects of the study. So my impression was that it was available. Obviously, and my memory from the quotations was that the company said that Amila was the most viable and the most ready hydroelectric project, hydropower project for Ghana at that moment, and it should proceed. The, so I have no, from what I understand, I don't think that there's a problem with making it public. Um, that is an issue. I believe for the Norwegian government and for the consultant and so forth. But we have remained steadfast as a party uh, in the opposition and now back in government to about bringing Amaila back on. And so we haven't deviated from that. There may be changes or amendments in design. Those are technical issues of no, no great importance. The issue is that we are talking about an energy mix of hydro, solar, wind if there's possible, uh, fossil fuel, natural gas. And so Amaila is one of those that is part of that energy mix. And we will remain faithful to that. So if it is that the company or the consultancy or Norwegian government is willing to make that available, yes. But this is one of the documents that was mentioned basically in that report um, accusing the government of not involving civil society 
into decision making and they were the question or, or the statement was uh, um, for example why this document was not made yeah, I mean, I remember those days mm -hmm. and that, that I know when we were doing Amila, uh, just to go back a little before 2015, was that I have was had the privilege of being with President Ramacha when Mr. Granger, as a leader of opposition, came with a huge team of 10 people to be briefed on Amila. And that was done with uh, screens and PowerPoints and projections. And then he asked for the documents. And I remember we produced and gave to Mr. Granger, and Mr. Greenwich was there, Mr. Harmon was there, uh, Mr. Williams, Basil Williams was there, and uh, Mr. Ramjatan was there, Mr. Patterson was there, if I'm getting everyone all right. Stacks, binders, binders of information that normally, as you pointed out, under our um, Access to Information Act, Consultations and negotiation going on in commercial undertakings are not made public or not released or shared until the, the negotiations finished. We gave them documents that were part of the whole commercial negotiation preparation for Myla. All the stacks. I remember, you know, uh, seeing Mr. Greenwich and smiling to myself, struggling to fetch all the binders as he came down the steps of OP. So. They were, co they were consulted as opposition. I can't say, um, I know that there were various discussions at various levels to do with Amila um, prior to 2014 uh, by the government. Um, and I know that went on even before because we had to go to the Norwegians on this as part of the low carbon development strategy and our carbon credit services where we were making money. So those consultations started long before. Um, so I can't remember all of those, but I think that the process was there. It was very public, and the media played a very important role in making as much information, whether they agreed with it or not, it was out there. So I, uh, I think that the Amaira mustn't become a football again and trying to dig and find some issue in relation to Amaira. Amaira is a project that was studied. The Norwegians found that it was creditable by, and as I said, the most ready project for hydropower in Guyana and, and, and the most viable so that um, if there's an issue that the, the document can be made public, I assume that is fine. <laughs> Lovely. Um, well, based on all that you would have explained, at least here we have a better understanding that those reports there out in the media are blatant and malicious, accusing yeah. government of not involving and yeah. not ensuring that the people are actively participating in the Yeah, but can I put my last Just lick in? Ahead. Let go me ahead. put a last lick <laughs> in, because you've <laughs> tempted me sorely. <laughs> and that is that I find it, uh, I remember in uh, 2017, in Parliament, the question was asked, because there was this rumor about this agreement on oil and gas, and it was asked, and so no, there's no agreement, there's no agreement, and again, it kept going like a, you know, this, uh, where there's smoke, there's fire, and this thing would not go down all of 2017. Is there an agreement? Is there some secret deal? Is there? No, no, no. There's record in the parliament. No, there's none. And then in December 2017, when it, and it was a parliament day, and on that day, one of the newspapers carried the letter written to the Bank of Ghana, opening the foreign currency account for the signature bonus from Exxon. And that's when everything blew up. And that is when in that, that parliament, the whole issue of the secret deal in October, in, in 2016, after that in 2018, then one was able to get a better look at that agreement. And of course, that is what we're dealing with now. But I find it highly hypocritical, you know, because it's saying to Guyanese people, you are stupid, you don't have a memory, you're suffering from amnesia, we could tell you anything we want and you will believe it. The issue is that the parliament records are there and the parliament records show that there was a secret deal, it was kept quiet for over a year. If it wasn't for the same civil society, the opposition, PVPC, and the media, 
constantly, constantly, constantly asking about where is this deal? We as Guyanese, we would have known nothing. Nothing. It would never have come out. And so we have to look at the lessons of what we've learned, you know? And so I think that if there, there are and will be sometimes in government things are being discussed that are not ready to be made public. There are very sensitive issues in government that can, can affect your ability to negotiate, can affect your ability at a variety of levels at the international and regional level. That is what government's about. And so when you're in government, it's not every day you can go out and say, well, we just had a discussion on so and so. Oh, you can't do that. That's not how government works. What you want to make sure with government is that is it working in a transparent and accountable way? Is information available? But you can't also, and, and I challenge in, in many countries, where, what can you know certain details at the moment? Sometimes you have to wait for that to be disclosed or to be reached at a certain point where you can make it public. And so I think that those who know these issues well, like what I'm saying, I think are being disingenuous in trying to say to the people, in some, or, or sometimes fooling the people, that, oh, they're not consulting, you know? And so we, we, we are democracy, and we've gone through a traumatic time in 2020. Five months waiting, a whole country, a whole nation on, on pause, on pause in the middle of COVID because a minority said, we don't accept the statements of poll. And that is why there's a little bit of the, the power of the majority, the power of the people, all the people, but we cannot be held back in our transformation and our movement forward by just a, a minority that doesn't have a constituency. So it's not to dismiss them and to say they don't have a role to play, but they cannot stop mo forward movement. But they have a role to play and they must play it well. They must play it well. And instead of being um, trying to, to, well, they must tell the truth in other words. And if they want to be, and I think every minister I know of, and I know that there are organizations that will come to me and say, Minister, we've been trying to do this, we can't get this through, could we meet me? Sometimes there's nothing to do with what I do. But you listen, you, you hear, you make notes, you raise the issue with an agency, you raise it with a minister. That's, that's part of the process to make sure people have a hearing, that they have a voice. And I'm prepared to play the role in that, and I know my other colleague ministers are. That's part of being accessible, visible, and, and inclusive. Thank you. As Minister with Responsibility for Parliamentary Affairs, would you care to comment on the state of affairs with the opposition? And a bit ticklish here. <laughs> there are currently <laughs> two vacant seats, one of which should be the opposition leader. Does this affect the work of Parliament? And if so, how can this be addressed? It doesn't really affect the work of Parliament. Mm -hmm. It affects more the issue of constitutional appointments. So you could have a situation in a Parliament where there is isn't a leader opposition for some time. Um, government has no control over that. But for, for constitutional positions, like when we have the next sitting, which should be soon, we have the Ethnic Relations Commission, which requires a two-thirds majority, but not the President's involvement. We have the Police Service Commission, which involves the President and the Leader of, of the Opposition, agreeing to who would be the chairman of the four that are passed in Parliament. You have the PPC, which has the five persons coming from Parliament. The Leader of the Opposition has no role to play in that. President appoints. You have the Women and Gender, which will require two-thirds, but the President doesn't have any involvement in that. And then you have the Natural Resource nominees for Natural Resource fund and public accountability, which will allow, one, the president to have those nominees, but also he can't have nomin he still waiting for the lead of the opposition to be appointed, so he can approach him and say, well, who's the nominee to the natural resource fund? And so it affects more the opposition from the point of view that they are not being able to play their role as provided for by the Constitution. And in a sense, um, it could delay uh, the, the appointment of various commissions or 
constitutional positions, etc. So it's more that area that it impacts on than, and at this point it hasn't done so in a big way, but it could if it extends for a long time. You have clearly outlined um, the policies and programs uh, implemented by government that would have impacted the lives of Guyanese people mm. over the years. How it's been two years into almost yeah. two years into this government's mm. administration. How do you see the um, in terms of where we were and where we are today? How do you see that um, impact on the on the Guyanese people coming? Well, let's go to another level in terms mm. of we have we are taking back what we lost and that was our preeminence in the international regional levels politics international arenas we're taking back what we lost so in the climate change in the agriculture these are we're taking back which is these are areas of our forte as a country and we're taking that back in, in a good way and the fact that all roads lead to Guyana that that is part of the what's taking place in this country. So yes, we have many, many issues to confront and to overcome, but at the same time, the the mood out there, the view out there of Guyana uh, is an extraordinarily positive one. And how do we as a people capitalize on that? From the government's point of view, one Guyana low carbon development strategy are the overarching pillars on which we are going to move forward with. There is now almost every week some investors flying in or somebody from um, the Middle East or from Canada, United States. We've never had this kind of attention. And also, to it challenges us because it's about investment and what's best for our country and making sure we get the best for our people. And um, so those are the big issues, the big issues. And I, I'm... When I saw the CPL, uh, what you call, the Carnival Cricket, it's a big achievement for us to be able to get in these games. Yes. Oh, and for three years, for three years. And people think, well, okay, that's not very important. It is important. It's important to our people. It's important to our economy. It's important to our image. And then you have, of course, all the other issues, Lennox, you're aware of, the programs to reduce poverty, um, the cash care, finding jobs, training, house lots, water. These are ongoing pro programs all the time that keep going. New, the dialysis uh, patients grant of $600,000. Um, we had, to, we used to give a, a subvention, a subsistence to dialysis patients up to 2015 of $300,000. And from 2015, well, after the government change, to 2020, it was removed completely. And even though we were in opposition, we made representation to the Minister of Health, to the Parliament, that this be restored. It never was. It is now restored and doubled. And instead, now the people get the cash in hand if they want to use it to take a taxi to the dialysis center uh, or to pay for it. That is their business. But $600,000 and dialysis is expensive, no doubt about that. But people were being denied access to dialysis all these years. I know some of the patients could not afford and got no support from APNU AFC government. So these are what you call the interventions to make people's lives better, to improve the quality of life. While we try to create more jobs, right, to, to deal with the house lots and the construction and the highways and the bridges, at a certain point there'll be too much work that available and people, I think, have to make up their mind, particularly young people and young men in particular, that do I want to sit in this village where there's no work, but there's work going on on the Demar Bridge, or there's a work going on on a highway, or there's a work going on on a drainage canal, I can do these things. And to leave where they are and go to where the jobs are. Because that's what happens all over the world. You go to where the jobs are. The jobs don't always come to you. And so, I think it's a whole, whole uh, what you call, uh, socio-cultural change of mindset we have to go through to in order to meet the challenges of this transformation that we can go through. It's our, it's our, 
This is our time. This is Guyana's time. Mm -hmm. And we've waited a long time for it. And we've gone through uh, much trauma, much difficulties, much tears, much tribulations. But this is our time as a people. And I truly believe that we can do it. Um, this is not to dispense with other people's views, but sometimes one has to be dogged. And uh, sometimes, what you call, uh, you know, have very clear vision of where you're going and just to keep going at it. Lovely. Minister, uh, in closing, in the interest of, you know, speaking to transparency, mm. accountability, and representation, right. yes. what is the one thing you would want persons to take away from this discussion and this report that you would have given? I, I hope that what I said has helped to, to, to give greater clarity on this issue, and I also hope that people feel comfortable that they can use the forms that are available. Ministries have websites and Facebooks, Facebook accounts. You have s social media accounts that are there. You have um, ministers you see all over the place. I mean, I go to the supermarket and people come and talk to me about their NIS or their old age pension. And some foreigners say to me, well, what are you doing in a supermarket? I said, who's going to do my shopping for me? I do it. And so, again, the people, it's our accessibility and our ability to communicate with our people. Obviously, we can't solve every problem, and obviously we can't, uh, you know, we have to make decisions. But I, I hope that people recognize that what we have going in our country is unique, it is special, and our responsibility, whether individuals, government, civil society, etc., is to work towards building this platform of inclusionary democracy and participation in a, in, and give it structure as we go along, because it's still embryonic, we're still working on it, that as we go along, it'll take form, it'll develop, it'll develop over time structures and terms of reference and administrative guidelines. We're not at that stage yet. We're still creating this model that I think is uniquely Guyanese. Thank you, Minister. We've just been hearing from the Honorable Minister of Parliamentary Affairs and Governance, Minister Gear, Gail Tishira, and this has been Progress Report. I've been your host, Lennox Gasper. Thank you for watching. That was, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> that was long, wasn't it? Oops. Hold on.